All right, here we go, lesson 10.3, we're gonna talk about properties of chords, okay? Remember, a chord is just a segment that goes across a circle. All right, so we got um, a couple different theorems that we're gonna work with. We got theorem 10.3, I'll explain that. We got a couple pictures, we got theorem 10.4, okay? Um, I just got one picture there, but I think it works both ways as well. We got theorem 10.5, and then finally we got theorem 10.6, okay? So four theorems, we're gonna run through them real quick. There's gonna be a second video that shows you some examples of these theorems, and then a third video that does some extra compass work, okay? And those are both pretty short. All right, theorem 10.3, this is what it says in the book. In the same circle or in congruent circles. Now, I did not draw this out showing the or in congruent circles part, but it works the same way. I'll draw you a quick sketch here in a second. Um, in the same circle or in congruent circles, two minor arcs are congruent if and only if their corresponding chords are congruent. Okay, keep in mind, if and only if tells us that things work both ways. So this is actually really, really, really simple. Basically what they're saying is if you have congruent chords, so if this chord is congruent to that chord, then automatically this arc is congruent to this arc right here. All right, so how do we write congruent arcs? AC is congruent to BD. So if we know this, then that automatically leads to this. Okay, congruent chords leads to congruent arcs. So they gave me the chords, I give them the arcs. Pretty simple, all right? If we look at it this way, this time I'm told that the arcs are congruent. All right, remember, anytime you need to pause the video, all right, copy the picture down as necessary. All right, uh, congruent arcs. So if the arcs are congruent, remember if and only if works both ways. So here we said if the chords are congruent and the arcs are congruent here, if the arcs are congruent, then the chords are congruent, okay? So I can go from arc to chord, or I can go from chord to arc, okay? It's very, very simple. Now, I'm gonna do a quick uh, reason, explanation for why that works. So if I were to draw these little quick things into the center of the circle here, all right, my given was that the uh, uh, chords were congruent, one mark, radii, all radii are congruent radius never changes. So what do we see about these triangles? We see side, side, side is congruent to side, side, side. These triangles are congruent. I know they don't look like it it's because I didn't use a ruler. All right, if the triangles are congruent and this angle is congruent to this angle, that's not because they're vertical angles. Those are not vertical angles, but they are congruent because of CPCTC. And if the uh, angle here, remember, equals the measure, the measure of this angle equals the measure of this arc, and the measure of this angle equals the measure of this arc. If these angles are the same, then their measures are the same, so the measures of these arcs are the same, so we've got uh, congruent arcs. Okay, down here we can do the same type of thing, but what we'll do is we'll work backwards. All right, so once again, I draw the radii, and I've got congruent radii, radius never changes. If the arcs are congruent, then that leads into the angles being congruent. Arcs are congruent, leads to the angles being congruent. Side angle side proves the triangles are congruent, and CPCTC proves the chords are congruent. So that's why this works, all right? It works the same way if you have separate circles as well, okay? As long as the circles themselves are congruent. How do we tell if circles are congruent? Hopefully you remember from a previous lesson, they have to have congruent radii, okay? In this case, if someone tells you that this chord is congruent to this chord, then automatically you can say that that arc is congruent to that arc. Okay, so it works if you have separate circles as long as the circles are congruent. So that is theorem 10.3. Okay, let's go to theorem 10.4. This one is um, one we're gonna use in some compass work and in another video, okay? There's a couple things going on here. Um, it actually kind of works both ways. I, I gotta draw a second picture, I didn't do that yet, I forgot to, but anyways, if, uh, this is what it says, if one chord is the perpendicular bisector of another chord, then the first chord is a diameter. So you can see that this is already perpendicular, that was given to me, and it's bisecting. If you are told this, okay, perpendicular bisector, then this chord doing the bisecting is a diameter, so BE is a diameter. So if they give you a picture like this and they say, what do you know? You can automatically say BE is a diameter. Okay, that's gonna be important in our third video for this lesson, all right? Uh, conversely, this, this also has a converse, but it doesn't work to say if and only if very well. So let me draw this circle really, really quick, quick here. Sorry about that, I thought I had it all set up to go, but I didn't. All right, here we go. If 
you know you have a diameter. So if they have a point here in the center of the circle or what looks to be really basically the center, unless they tell you it's not the center, it's the center. They aren't just going to put a random dot there for no apparent reason. All right, so that is a diameter. If that diameter is perpendicular to a chord, okay? If a diameter is perpendicular to a chord, then what does it do to the chord? It bisects it, okay? That theorem and this theorem are basically converses of each other. If it's a perpendicular bisector, then it's a diameter. If it's a diameter and perpendicular, then it is a bisector. Now, you can't just automatically say that if it's a diameter, then it's a perpendicular bisector. Let me give you an example of that. Okay. This is a diameter, yes. Does it perpendicularly bisect this? No. Okay, that's pretty obvious. Okay. If it's a diameter and perpendicular, then it's a bisector. You could also say if it's a diameter and it's a bisector, then it's going to be perpendicular. That would work as well. Okay. And we can go through this um, and, and prove it. Let me give you a real quick proof here. So if I draw this radius here, this radius here, remember this wasn't given up here, so kind of ignore those two marks for right now. Radius is always congruent to its, uh, itself, radius of a circle never changes. We got reflexive property here. I got angle side side. Angle side side does not work unless the angle is a right angle. In this case, it is a right angle, so we've got HL. HL congruence theorem proves the triangles are congruent, and therefore CPCTC gives me these two things that I told you about. Okay, we could do something likewise here, all right? And, and prove that uh, we've got congruent triangles and that's why this thing has to be a diameter. I'm not gonna go through the whole proof. All right, theorem 10.5. All right, theorem 10.5 works like this. All right, so we got a picture here. Um, so go ahead and copy that down real quick and then uh, I'll, I'll talk your way, I'll talk our way, sorry, through the, the theorem. All right. Here we go. If a diameter of a circle is perpendicular to a chord, we can see that this is a diameter. It goes through this point. Remember that point's not just some random point. If it's there, it's there for a reason. All right, so if a diameter is perpendicular to a chord, then it bisects the chord. And we already talked about that. And it bisects the arc, okay? So we already talked about bisecting the chord. So because we have a diameter perpendicular, it's gonna bisect the chord. Now it's also going to bisect this arc, arc PR. So we need to basically show that arc PQ is congruent to arc QR. So how do we do that? Well, we draw a radius again. We end up drawing a radius a lot in these things, okay? So I draw this radius, a radius never changes. So those are congruent, we've got right angles. So what do we got? Well, we got HL again. So by HL, these triangles are congruent. If the triangles are congruent, then by CPCTC, these angles are congruent. And remember, central angles lead out to arcs. So if the central angles are congruent, then the arcs are congruent. So therefore, PQ, arc PQ, is congruent to arc QR. And that's what theorem 10.5 is telling us. Okay. So if you have a diameter that is perpendicular to a chord, then it bisects the chord. We already talked about that. And it also bisects the arc. All right, that's theorem 10.5. Okay, and then finally, theorem 10.6. All right, theorem 10.6, this is an if and only if one again. Okay, here's our first picture. All right, here's our second picture with our given up here. Okay, this given is actually just marked up in the picture. So go ahead and copy this picture down real quick. Uh, pause it, whatever you need to do, and then come down to this one. Copy it, pause it, and let's keep moving. All right, here we go. If two chords are the same perpendicular distance from the center point of a circle, then they are congruent to each other. Now the book doesn't phrase it quite like that. It says this, in the same circle or in congruent circles. Just like that very first theorem we did, we had two separate circles that were congruent circles. The theorem worked as well. This would as well. I'm not going to draw that one out though. All right, in the same circle or in congruent circles, two chords are congruent if and only if they are equidistant from the center point. Remember, our book uses that phrase or that word equidistant. Um, I always change it just a little bit to say same perpendicular distance because if you forget that equidistant means they have to be perpendicular distance and you're going to be in trouble. So it's going to keep emphasizing that to you, same perpendicular distance. So AF is the same perpendicular distance from the center point as BD. Same, got it marked, perpendicular, got those marked distances. So therefore AF is congruent to BD. That would be our conclusion to this. All right. Now we could go through, we could prove that that is true and so on. It just takes a little while, but we could prove it. 
Uh, it deals with some addition stuff. Um, I don't, I don't want to go through the whole video. It'll just extend the video for an excessive amount of time. So in this case, you can believe me that's true. If you don't believe me, I will prove it to you at some point if you want me to. But basically, we draw a radius like we've done before. We'd have congruent triangles all right, by HL. We actually have four different congruent triangles, and then we'd take those arcs out, and we'd get two different, we'd get four different congruent arcs, and we'd add the arcs together and get two congruent arcs, and then with congruent arcs, it leads to congruent chords like we looked at in our very first theorem. Okay, so that's kind of a real rough um, uh, idea of that proof, and if you understand geometry, you should be able to follow that along uh, decently. All right, uh, the inverse, or sorry, not inverse, the converse of that theorem says that if the chords are congruent, then we should be able to say something as well. So up here we said if they were the same perpendicular distance from the center point, then the chords were congruent. Here, if the chords, JL, it's hard to mark that because K is kind of in the way here, so I just have it written up here. If JL is congruent to PN, then they have to be the same perpendicular distance from the center point. As this is drawn right now, you cannot tell me that KM is congruent to MO because we don't have the perpendicular marks. This kind of goes back to that angle bisector theorem idea that we did in another chapter. All right. If these chords are congruent, then they are the same perpendicular distance from the center. So if I put a right angle mark here and I put a right angle mark here, you should be able to tell me that KM is congruent to MO. All right. And that is theorem 10.6. All right, so four theorems. All right, I'll review them real quick, one at a time, and then you've got two other videos, sh much shorter videos to watch dealing with uh, application. So this one said, if the chords were congruent, then the arcs were congruent. And conversely, if the arcs are congruent, then the chords are congruent. I didn't mark those chords up, but they would be congruent. So if the chords are congruent, then the arcs are congruent. If the arcs are congruent, then the chords are congruent. If a um, diameter or sorry, if, if a chord, this one, if a chord is the perpendicular bisector of another chord, then the chord doing the bisecting is a diameter, all right? And then we kind of looked at the other version of that, which actually leads more into this. If a diameter is perpendicular to a chord, then it bisects the chord and it bisects the arc. Now, technically, it would bisect this major arc as well. The book only talks about the minor arc, but PT would be congruent to TR as well. And then finally, if two chords are the same perpendicular distance from the center point, then they are congruent. And conversely, if two chords are congruent, then they are the same perpendicular distance from the center point. Watch the other videos to get some algebraic applications as well as a compass construction that you need to do.